Thank you, Ed. Uh, yeah, so my name is Adrian Gonzalez Martin. I'm a machine learning engineer at Seldon. I'm also a fellow of the Institute for Ethical AI and ML. And what we're going to be talking today about is about uh, security challenges that we generally face in machine learning and the MLOps space. And this is a space that we haven't dived much into it so far. Uh, it's a space that is very well researched in the DevOps area, for example, uh, but not in the machine learning space. And it's probably going to be like the next, uh, like the next frontier, something that we need to start thinking about uh, because we are now we are starting to have these massive platforms, these massive MLOps platforms. We know how to tackle a few problems. We have a lot of tools but we haven't looked much into how these, uh, like the attack surface that this exposes and how to, how to cover that. We talk with, like, as with anything uh, related to MLOps, it provides a new set of challenges that were not present there before with uh, DevOps. Uh, and just to highlight, uh, just to clarify, like, uh, we're gonna see some, some examples and, and we're gonna see some technical solutions. However, at the end of the day, all of these solutions, uh, the focus is, uh, the, the only way to solve these, most of these problems is uh, relying on humans, relying on, pro on processes. Which is again something that was the same thing in, in the DevOps space, right? Like, it's all about uh, getting everyone to talk and getting everyone to work together. And if we see uh, about, so uh, uh, extending from that, following up from that, what we like to talk about is about ML TechOps. So, uh, which is the natural extension of, of SecOps to the MLOps space. And this is like, a, a, it, it combines uh, uh, several disciplines. So, so you have like a bit of DevOps, you have things about SecOps, uh, you have things about MLOps. And if we want to look at solutions in this area, like how we solve this, we can always just uh, go back to the DevOps book, uh, take some pages from it, see what was done there in the area in order to, to nail sec SecOps on, on, on like, I guess, classic uh, DevOps. And if we look at what was done there, uh, we can see, for example, the OWASP top 10 of vulnerabilities. And this is essentially, uh, so OWASP is this institution that publishes, well, it does a lot of things. One of the things it does is it publishes this top 10 uh, assessment of the most common vulnerabilities that we can see uh, uh, in, in, in web systems, mainly web applications. Uh, one of the cool things about OWASP is that uh, the target audience of OWASP is not security researchers. So security researchers are the one building this list but the target audience is actor practitioners. So, you, so uh, both software engineers and uh, I guess more DevOps people. And it's one of these, also something interesting is that some of these are targeted directly to them. So things that they can have control over, things that they can own, things that they can apply to their own product. Uh, both for engineers, some of them apply more for engineers, software engineers, other ones for DevOps like securing systems, having proper access control, et cetera. Um, what we are going to see during this talk is how we can build a similar list, but for machine learning systems, for MLOps platforms, and how that also will extend naturally to also like data scientists and the work that they do. Not sure many of you may not be familiar with this slide, uh, but this is essentially like uh, um, there is across the board, there is an interest in uh, securing uh, MLOps systems. And this is like the list of, 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 of principles that the LFAI published uh, for trusted AI, like there are a few, like, these are like things that would be really nice to have in any machine learning system. One of them is security. The problem is that we don't even quite know what that means. And that's why we started this um, uh, uh, working group uh, defining um, uh, some, what would be like the best practices uh, for the end to secure the end to end machine learning lifecycle. And this is like, uh, so taking, taking back the slide from the keynote, this is how like a whole end-to-end -end, um, machine learning system kind of uh, would look like. And as you can see, like you have a security risk. There's an attack surface on every component. Now, today we only have uh, 30 minutes, maybe less. We want to have some questions. So we are not going to be able to focus on everything. What we're going to do instead is just focus on the serving aspect, on the, on the last uh, uh, row of that diagram. And just to ensure all of us are in the same page, uh, what we mean by, by the last stage, by the deployment stage, serving stage. What we generally have uh, in, in MLOps systems is uh, you, so the data scientists would usually provide either uh, a set of model weights, uh, that is essentially the binary artifact, the binary output from training their model, or some, well, sometimes data scientists or sometimes machine learning engineers or software engineers would provide a custom, some piece of custom code, some kind of uh, custom inference server 
uh, that, can, that knows how to run their modules, or maybe sometimes both of them. Once you have that, you just uh, deploy that. And what do we have when we deploy that? What you usually have is a, some sort of inference server uh, running that custom uh, blob, a custom set of bundle weights that you got, uh, or and or a bit of custom code, which is uh, uh, the glue code that is relevant for your use case, which knows how to load this blob and how to run, how to perform inference with this blob. And uh, through the talk, we're going to run a few examples uh, of how these security surfaces can be exposed. So the first thing that we're going to do is to uh, deploy a model on our on our uh, like test cluster, test Kubernetes cluster, and 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 just see how that look like. like how that looks like. So what I'm going to do is. Uh, 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 I'm not sure if you can all see that correctly, but it's a bit too. Maybe a bit hard this way. All right. So, uh, yeah, for a second, let's see it now. Uh, All right, so what we generally would have is a, a so this, is, this would be like first, like the training state, we're gonna run through that very quickly. But you would have some, some sort of requirements, uh, you would just install those, you would train a secular model in this case, simple example, uh, and you can see that you can run predictions with it. And uh, what you would do next is you serialize it. And frameworks like scikit-learn, uh, the recommended approach to serializing it is actually to just use something like Joplip, which is Pickling the things essentially, and we're going to talk more about pickles now. Uh, but the binary artifact like, looks something like that. It's like a big blob of things. You can recognize some things, but most things don't make any sense. So once we have that uh, on our cluster, we're going to have Ming.io uh, running. That's where we're going to store our artifacts, and we're going to move. We're going to copy that artifact to, to Ming.io, and then we're going to deploy it. I think in this case, we're going to deploy it with Seldon Core. Uh, it doesn't matter. Generally, like any kind of, of serving engine, would do the same thing. Uh, you have uh, some artifact and you deploy it to your cluster, which in the end, like when you deploy that, what you're going to get is a set of pods that are there running there. And again, sorry if uh, maybe I think the outputs are there. It's not, it's not, uh, I can't see very well what's in there. So hopefully, hopefully what I'm saying makes sense. Uh, once we have that in there, we can then send requests and we can, we can see there how, how we just, so we send like a, like a, I think a NumPy tensor. Uh, we encode that to the, to the V2 protocol, which is the protocol that, in this case, Eldon Core speaks, and uh, we get the response back, which we, when we decode it, it's like an amp array. So it's all, all looking good. Uh, now, if I can just uh, move the slides here again, I guess I need to move this back here. Cool. So we now have our model deployed, and let's look at what security risk areas we can see there. So we're going to start with the first one. So we talked briefly, we mentioned pickles. We are picking, picking our artifacts. Pickles, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, are, is like Python's native way of serializing any custom, any code object in Python. So it could be classes, it could be functions, it could be dictionaries, it could be anything. Uh, what this means is that you, when you unload the pickle, uh, you can run any arbitrary code, anything. So one, uh, one uh, risk area is, okay, what happens if an attacker somehow gets access to this uh, pickle? They can run anything they want. And we're gonna see a quick example. Let me just move this over again very quickly. Uh, where is the mouse? Oops. Uh, yeah, so what we are going to do is, uh, hopefully it shows in the screen, what we're going to do is just to tweak the model that we try to serialize to inject a poison uh, reduce function, which is essentially the function that Pickle is going to use. And what we're going to do with that is uh, ensure that when the model gets serialized, it gets serialized as a system call. 
Uh, in this case, what it's going to do is dump the, the environment variables of, of that pod where the model is running. So we can, so we do that, I think it's showing here, and when we, uh, so then the, the blob changes, the pickle changes, but it's again like, like, like a big blob, like a binary blob, it's very hard to see what's going on there. So we load that to, uh, to Ming.io, we deploy our new unsafe model, and if we look, uh, so if we were to exec into that model, into that pod, we would see that in fact it created that, that like bound file uh, with all the environment variables running there. So same as this, you can run anything like you have full access. Uh, so let me now just move back to the slides. Here and now it's in here. Oh, there it is. All right, perfect. So pickles are super widespread in machine learning uh, frameworks and machine learning libraries. So we see, for example, uh, here are a couple of examples. So we talk about scikit-learn. That's what the docs recommend to just pickle your artifact. Uh, Torch, PyTorch also uses pickles. Uh, again, another uh, potential attack surface to do anything that you want. Uh, Keras as well uses pickles. Everything uses pickles. And as you can see, it's like giving a wide door to your cluster to do anything you want. Uh, it's very hard to scan pickles to see whether they are malicious or not. Uh, so this is mainly like a trust or discard problem. So we need to ensure, uh, so like the kind of solution here would be to ensure that there is uh, um, some, some, some trust between all the supply chain steps. So here we will talk about like signing the artifacts, ensuring they come from the right place from someone who we trust and that they haven't been poisoned uh, along the way. Now, uh, next security risk area, uh, we're going to talk about what's the problem when you give access to your model. So generally, like in, in, in web applications, when you give access to the model, like the main thing that you can do, like the worst thing that you can do is that um, someone who is not authorized may, I don't know, create a grand user, access the grand user details, etc. Here, the problem is that it doesn't stop just at that. So let's say you have an inference endpoint. Uh, exposing an inference endpoint without any control essentially gives uh, any attacker access to, it's still a black box, but even with just a black box, they can learn a lot about your model. And one thing that they can learn is how to uh, create adversarial attacks. So for example, here, I don't know uh, if many of you are familiar with adversarial attacks. You can see some examples there on the right of how, uh, so the images on the left-hand side column are the, 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 the original images, and then the images on the right-hand side column are uh, the, the, the poison images, let's say. So they are images which have very small tweaks uh, that are, uh, are not perceptible to a human eye, but are enough to change completely the prediction that the model is going to make. If you expose your model and you leave that black box wide open and wide accessible, an attacker could learn how to craft these, these, these things and, and could basically just turn any machine learning system unusable because they would be able to tweak it. So in the, in the MLF space, it's not just about authorizing who has access to something. It's also about authorizing the payload itself. How can we do that? So, there are tools like, uh, uh, like Alibi Detect uh, that provide uh, detectors. So you have the ability to create a detector that has been trained to detect uh, potential adversarial attacks. And to say, okay, don't trust this payload. Like it looks fine, it's, it's completely like, like it's well-formed, everything is okay, but this may be someone who's trying to get access to, 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 or to learn more about your model or to learn how to craft adversarial attacks. And once we know that, we can react accordingly. Like we can say, okay, just don't forward that to the model, or just log it, or wherever we want. There is a second step of access, uh, which would be like white box, act, white box access. So before we were talking about how, like, if a user were to gain uh, uh, wide access to our model store, they could just inject like a poison pickle and have full access to the cluster. However, even if they can just read this model artifact, they can still learn a lot of things about your model. They can. I leak some of the training data. They can do uh, so many things. And, and one of the interesting things is that we, don't, we know that they can do many things, but we don't even know how far this can go because at the same time as we don't know how to secure systems because they are not as widespread, there have also not been that many uh, attacks yet, but we know it's a wide door open. 
Going further, a user, and this is something, this is from, from, from our real paper, uh, you can even use models to leak uh, some of the training data. So for example, uh, you know, uh, generative models, they are pretty trendy, like large language models that can generate text based on a prompt. Uh, so users were tested, some researchers were testing this out, and they found out that, for example, you can, you can set a prompt like, like user, this name, password. And the model will just leak the password of that user. Because it has learned to generate that data. Same thing with addresses, same thing with names. Uh, um, there were like a bunch of personal details that could just get leaked and, and, and bits, snippets from the training data set that could just get extracted verbatim. So now so far we have talked about like the model artifact, we have talked about the model. If we continue going down to the infra level, the next step would be the custom code that you execute. So we talked before about how generally data scientists would deploy a model artifact, or maybe you have machine learning engineers uh, that would just provide a custom inference runtime that runs in your pod. When you provide custom code, I mean, when you use dependencies, we'll talk about dependencies later, but when you run custom code, you have the risk of introducing uh, vulnerabilities. A good thing here is that now we are getting more into the classic DevOps space where there is a lot more tooling, there are a lot more things around. So for code vulnerabilities, we have uh, a few uh, like static analyzers that can tell us, well, this code probably has some uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, but even in dependencies, like it can still be an issue. Like for example, here's an example from TensorFlow um, where it gives you wide access to load any kind of YAML. And again, YAML is, is a bit like, like pickles in a way. It, if done in the wrong way, you can also let an attacker run any arbitrary code. In general, like YAML libraries, we have like a load YAML function and a safe load YAML function that kind of uh, strips these things out. There are, again, like tools like, like the GitHub uh, built-in code scanner tool. There are other tools like Bandit that we can use. In general, the good thing is, okay, there are tools we can use them. However, when we talk about MLOps, we probably also have notebooks, right? Like data scientists will may use notebooks. And notebooks also have code. And here's where it becomes a bit muddier. Like how can you, like we have tools to do a static analysis on like a normal code base, but how do you ensure that in a notebook? A notebook which is not linear, it's, uh, you don't know what extra context, what extra state it may have. Things already start to get a bit muddier. And this, and this is where you kind of get to the edge of what's out there, what things you can use, what things you can automate. Now, dependencies. So uh, we talked previously about dependencies. So for example, we saw that TensorFlow issue uh, that introduced like a security risk. In general, well, this is more of a Python problem, but in general, dependencies are hard. Even like if it's not Python, if it's Go or anything else, dependencies are still hard. Uh, any kind of dependency that you trust, even if you trust it, can introduce some security risk. The problem is that is like you can track the, like the first level of dependencies, but then you need to think about the second level, the third level, and that's where the problems may come in. And this is where issues may come in. So for example, uh, we see here like a few examples of how like when you don't have any kind of control or what you install, you may run into issues. And here also, like, like these are some, some like famous examples. There are even a more exotic one, more esoteric one. So for example, I will go back. So you can see here, like we installed Secular, okay. Uh, there was uh, these security researchers who tried to say, well, a lot of people may include a typo when they install pip install. When they say pip install scikit-learn, maybe instead of saying, typing scikit-learn, they may type like, say, scikit-learn. Oh, no, like they're switching to two letters. And he said, well, what happens if I publish a package with that name? And because pip also gives you control, pip lets you execute any kind of code when you install it. Uh, what happens if I put there a vulnerability? And of course, everyone typing the, the wrong package name got that. So I don't know, I can't remember the numbers, but like the attack was a massive success. Like he wasn't trying to do any harm, so all the attacks were harmless. But it showed that even just that random thing is can introduce a lot of security risks. Um, we're probably gonna skip this example in the interest of time, but basically uh, it was a bit to show like how bad this problem can get and how bad like just, so using our requirements, uh, we installed like four packages, I think, five packages, 
So it's five packages introduced, like, in total it was like, I think, 50 or more dependencies, which are like second, third, fourth level dependencies. Some of these we have no control over. The solution here is generally to use more like log files, which is something that other languages use. Python doesn't that much. Now there are starting to, 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 to appear tools that do that. So for, for example, poetry, uh, that kind of lets you control that. But yeah, going forward though, uh, uh, still in the dependencies world, um, generally, yeah, you, like the flow would go like, as you saw, like you have a, like the, the data scientist in this case, would just have is a local requirements TXT, we install a few things, and that's it, and join their model, et cetera. However, uh, uh, packages like, like tools like MSFlow, uh, in order to make, in order to let the data scientists also package up what these dependencies look like, like what these versions should look like, MSFlow, when you look at model, also looks like a conda.jaml file, but basically, which basically says how the environment should look like. This is just a way to, for data scientists to have control over like the versions of the packages they use. That's pretty cool, but that, what that means is that then when you move to production, when you deploy that model, the set of dependencies will get installed uh, uh, dynamically. Which means you now have like more issues because it's not like you have like this previous static set of dependencies that you install and you're adding a Docker file. No, now what you have is a dynamic set of dependencies that is coming from your model storage. Uh, a solution for this, for example, something that uh, 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 as part of the ML server project, something that we have been collaborating on with MLflow is kind of like, well, how can we pre-build this environment so that we just don't do like, like random uh, or like that dynamic installing installation when we deploy models. But yeah, again, going back to, to, to the main thread, so uh, dependencies, again, they are not as much of a MLOps specific problem. They are again a DevOps problem, but one that we need to think about. But what that means is that we have a lot of toolies, tools that we can use to detect CVEs, detect vulnerabilities, Etc. So, for example, Dependabot or, or Dependency Check Safety. These are tools that will check for TBEs in your in your dependencies and that will uh, flag when something is not secure. Even PIP have issues. So it's not just even dependencies. It's also like what the what system packets managers are using, um, which kind of leads now into like the next level. So now we have uh, uh, so we have looked at the model artifact. We have looked at the uh, uh, custom runtime. With your custom code, we have looked at the dependencies. Now let's look at where those dependencies run, where all of that runs, which generally, if you are not a uh, uh, crazy person, would be some sort of Docker image. Docker images are essentially operating systems inside, so you also have the same kind of vulnerabilities that you would get in, in a regular computer. Like now, instead of having the vulnerabilities in scikit-learn, you will have vulnerabilities in know, some kind of, of uh, uh, like Vim. So you have vulnerability in Vim. Um, but again, this is also part of like the classic DevOps world, which means there are tools uh, you can use to automate your scans. For example, in Cell Core, the Cell Core project we use, uh, and the MSR project we use uh, Sneak, which is a, yeah, it's also a sponsor, keep forgetting. And it's uh, a tool that just lets you run automated scans every time you change anything. And there are others like, like Trivi by AquaScan, there are a few of them. And then going down an extra layer, you now have uh, to think about the, like the classical security risk that you would get at the infrastructure level. And here uh, would be more things like RBAC, would be things like, um, like uh, uh, MTLS, uh, the, like classical things that you would need to think about Kubernetes. And we are not gonna dive too much into this one, uh, well, because it's a massive topic. Just today, actually, there was a, a whole co-located event that was just about security. Uh, so yeah, probably like if you want to learn more about this one, uh, I would check those out, the, the, those talks, or which I guess will be in YouTube soon, or uh, probably there will be like some other talks from the main KubeCon event about security. Yeah, I know, right? Like uh, we have seen like a lot of security risk areas. Um, uh, things look quite, quite, quite bad. Uh, what do we do about that? So. If we were to go through all these, these, these different uh, vulnerabilities that we saw, uh, we would be able to recreate something similar to the old WASP top 10 that we talked about initially, but for the MLOps space. So instead of uh, a broken access control, you would have like, like unrestricted model endpoints. So it's like access to your uh, model as a black box. Instead of, of cryptographic failures, you have access to the actual model artifacts, which is where you could poison pickles, you could um, 
have access to your model as a white box, so with full transparency of what's going on there, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, as in always, the focus here, the good thing about this list, which covers some of the risks that we have seen, is that the target audience, like the focus, so the responsibilities of securing into one of these, of these steps of preventing these risk areas are uh, split between, uh, some of them would be the data scientists, some of them would be uh, the, the, the uh, machine learning engineer, the software engineer, some of them would be uh, responsibility of the DevOps uh, expert, which means we can leverage that, or we can, and here's where like the added value of platforms come in. We could ensure, we can build platforms that ensure that these uh, things are built into our machine learning systems. And some of them, uh, what we will involve is essentially just uh, uh, leveraging the power of platforms to have single entry points, single, uh, um, uh, yeah, single entry points to each one of the steps. So, so that you don't just give uh, like a Kubernetes cluster to a data scientist and say, okay, deploy your models. Instead of that, you give them a platform, you give them an abstraction that has built in all these automations. What, does, what that allows you is to uh, uh, let each one of the, of the, of the pieces of the puzzle uh, be responsible of their own scope. So for example, uh, the DevOps engineer here would be the one securing that the Kubernetes platform where we are deploying our models has an MTLS, uh, the endpoint server restricted, et cetera, et cetera. Or that the software engineer or machine learning engineer that is uh, building our custom runtimes has control over uh, uh, or, or has just uh, like a few endpoints to deploy these custom runtimes, which then would trigger like the automated scans, automated dependency scans, uh, pre-building, any dependencies, etc. And same thing with the data scientists. Let's just give them a single entry point to provide their training artifacts, which would allow us to then run, uh, kick off like any uh, scans on the pickles, like uh, uh, sign checks, etc., etc. Going further, uh, we can even uh, uh, create automations, create tooling for data scientists, etc., to uh, have the security built in by design. So for example, something that we have been working on is having a set of templates that have all these best practices like uh, code scans, uh, uh, dependency logs, etc., built into. So for example, within the ML server CLI, you can add like ML server in it. Oh, that's wrong actually. So be ML server in it. And uh, it would create a project, a project template with all these things built into it. If you are interested more to learn if you're interested to learn more about this, uh, we have now kick-started, there is now a new working group, it's part of the, of the CNCF, uh, called MLSSecOps uh, Working Group. Uh, you can see the details there of when we, when we join to discuss, talk about these things, talk about best practices. The key goals here would be, for example, to finalize this set of top 10 vulnerabilities, to have something uh, set in stone, and going forward to kind of, yeah, set security standards, etc. Find further resources, resources for the talk, you can find the links on the deck, and that's it. Three we have. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>